Um, so, hi, I'm Allison Hurt, and I'm the graphics editor on the visuals team at NPR. Um, we're an interdisciplinary team of photographers, photo editors, designers, and developers who help tell stories in the NPR newsroom. Um, my focus most often is on small-scale, short turnaround graphics that accompany stories published in our CMS. Um, bar charts, maps, tables, um, things that need to be turned around anywhere from a couple hours to a couple days. Um, so I've been trying to cook more lately, um, but inevitably that half hour recipe actually takes me like an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and then I finally realized that uh, these recipes often don't take into account how long it takes to get everything ready so you can actually make dinner. Um, you have to clean the cook service, find the right pots and cooking implements, chop all those vegetables. Um, if you prep everything ahead of time, the actual cooking process goes much more efficiently. You're able to focus on the act of cooking rather than that onion you're racing to chop before the garlic burns in the pan. <laughs> um, and really the same philosophy applies to a lot of the work that we do that needs to be done on a very short timeline. Um, if your tools and processes are set up ahead of time, you're good to go when the assignment comes in. Um, or maybe this is a slightly better analogy. You're an iron chef and you've got to be ready for whatever challenge or secret ingredient Chairman Kaga throws down. Today's secret ingredient is yam. Um, so from here I'm going to talk um, a lot about our specific tools, um, all of which are open source and available on GitHub. Um, what works for us may not work for you, um, but hopefully there are some useful ideas here as you um, optimize your own internal best practices. Um, so this is what we're starting with. On our team, everyone's using Macs, running the latest or near latest um, operating system. Um, we host our work on Amazon S3. Uh, when we develop our uh, projects, we're running a Flask app to, um, locally to render content dynamically. Um, and then we bake out flat files to deploy to S3. Sort of philosophically, our team prefers to build static sites over dynamic sites with like a database backend. Um, static sites stand up better to heavy traffic um, and there's less or no kind of long-term maintenance required. Um, and so many of our projects are just kind of like, you know, one-offs that they're not necessarily things that need to be kind of maintained over a long period of time. Um, we do some development in Python. Um, most of what we do is in JavaScript. Um, most charts and data visualizations are done in D3. So um, first we start with, um, we all start from the same place, working from the same initial development environment. Um, on our team blog, we have a how to set up your computer guide. Um, and we use it ourselves as a resource um, whenever we have a new teammate or someone gets a new machine. Um, we have a new intern, and that's three times a year. Um, one of the first thing he or she does is they wipe their assigned machine, they set it up from scratch, and then they update the blog post. Um, because, you know, if there's like a new OS that's come out, like inevitably there are new quirks that are introduced. Um, every project that we build has a readme with detailed setup instructions, and it's generally like structured the same way. Um, you install Node, you make a virtual environment, you pip install requirements. Um, each project operates in its own virtual environment with the requirements text file that lists all of the relevant dependencies. Um, this makes it easy to start a new project, to pick up someone else's code, to go back and look at an old project. Um, and we're also playing with sort of smaller optimizations like writing Apple scripts to launch terminal windows that are relevant to a given project. Um, this one is for our daily graphics rig, which requires three terminal windows. One for, uh, to generate new projects and publish them out, one for the web server, and one um, to commit graphics to GitHub, because we store our graphics in a separate private repo. Um, so, uh, guilty admission, um, as recently as a few years ago, we were still sort of copying and even editing files directly on the server. Um, we had a few real backups of our work, and it was very hard to work collaboratively on the same file without big fitting each other. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't be like Uman, um, back up your work, so if it catches fire, you can recover it. GitHub is your friend. <laughs> I love that GIF. <laughs> um, also have a style guide or some agreed upon best practices. Um, that's the link to ours up there on GitHub. 
Um, this is a snippet from our team's JavaScript best practices document. Um, some of the highlights, we prefer single quotes to double quotes. Um, most, Java, most JavaScript variables should be camel case, um, unless they're constants or configuration parameters, in which case they're all caps with underscores. So you can tell the difference between them like at a glance. Um, we prefer to use bracket notation rather than dot notation. Um, I know that a lot of like D3 example code out there is all about dot notation. You know, D dot a, like A or D dot whatever. Um, but I do like how bracket notation makes it clear that you know, you're accessing a piece of data rather than like, you know, trying to like call a function or like get the length of the array or something like that. Um, and it lets you pass in variables. Um, anyway, I'm not saying this is how everyone else should write their JavaScript. This is just these are the standards that our team has agreed uh, to follow so that we're all consistent in our work. Um, and a coding style guide helps make your code more consistent and readable like to current teammates offering feedback and bug fixes um, and also to future you. Um, also important, have defined color and type standards um, and sort of bake these in. Um, these will probably evolve over time, um, but it's much easier to work within a design system, especially on a really short deadline, than it is to have to like reinvent it every time. Um, also, um, one thing that we're trying to be better at, we're not all working on the same projects, um, and it's sometimes hard to keep up with what everybody else is doing and how they're solving problems. So we've recently started periodic code review sessions among the team members who write code to discuss and critique approaches we've taken in our work. Um, and we're looking to do the same with periodic design reviews. Um, we found that it's useful to have a consistent, a consistent starting point for all of our projects. Um, and for us, our projects tend to follow one of two tracks, you know, our big standalone projects and smaller works that we embed into stories in our CMS. Um, with the bigger projects, we clone what we call the app template. It includes less, bootstrap, um, custom Google events for analytics, um, Google spreadsheet in in integration. Um, I'll talk more about that soon. Um, and some uh, GitHub project management helpers like default issue labels and tickets for all those things like device testing that we have to do for every single project. Um, we've even gotten into things recently like A-B testing. Um, so we. We build our project on top of that, and afterwards, if we learn some new way to optimize our process, we fold that back into the app template for the next project. Um, incidentally, uh, this particular project, um, we've learned a lot since this project, which ran a little over a year ago. Um, it was a massive undertaking, um, an international documentary project that followed the supply chain of a t-shirt from cotton in Mississippi to yarn in Indonesia to assembly in Bangladesh to and then to Brooklyn for printing. <laughs> it's all over the place. Um, and it was a combination of video and text and graphics, and um, it, was, it was quite a project. Um, for smaller projects, um, like quick turnaround graphics that go with news stories, we have a single overall project that we call Daily Graphics. Um, it's a lighter weight version of the app template with um, some sort of customizations we've made like for this particular use case. Um, everything exists in the same repo. It's all part of the same ecosystem. So in this case, we're cloning folders of starter code um, for various frequently used chart types. And they have the HTML, the JavaScript, the CSS, and a Google spreadsheet for text. Um, so in this case, we're just, whoops. Uh, we're just typing in like a fab command, and it just copies over a folder of, file, of stuff. Um, and honestly, frankly, there are so many ways I, there are really only so many times I want to define an axis or draw stacked bars in D3. I kind of just want to do it once and then reuse it. Um, this way I have starter code to give me part of the way there or most of the way if it's a really simple graphic. Um, and then I can modify it as needed for the, for the project at hand or go in a completely different direction. Um, so there are um, also like common design problems that we come across all the time. Um, and you can certainly adapt them from project to project, but oftentimes you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, for example, our code templates already include approaches for making our D3-based graphics work responsively. Um, about half our, our audience is on mobile, so we need to produce work that they can read and understand. Um, 
we went to almost fully code-based graphics in part because with a flat chart, a static chart, the text may be totally readable on desktop, but on a phone, everything is scaled down and impossible to read. Um, so one thing I like to do with charts is uh, lock the aspect ratio. Everything stays at four by three or 16 by nine. Um, so the relationship of elements within the chart um, remains the same. Um, I may also adjust the number of y, of y axis and x axis ticks depending on the display width, which is not the same as the window width. Um, on desktop, we have a right rail for an ad and related stories. Um, as the as the window shrinks, the right rail goes away, and there's um, extra padding here and there. So the width available to the actual chart shifts quite a bit. Um, so our usual strategy for handling the, window, handling the window resize is a bit kind of cheating. Um, when the screen resizes, the existing chart is destroyed and quickly redrawn to reflect the new dimensions. Um, if the graphic's relatively simple, there's no obvious performance hit. Um, but for more complex graphics, say like a world map where there are lots of objects being drawn to the screen, this isn't really an optimal approach. Like it becomes kind of visibly sluggish. Um, it's better to draw the map once and then update it at the page sizes. And honestly, like the only people who are doing like the, the squishy, like expandy thing are like other nerds. So <laughs> it's not like your average user is doing this, so. Um, we've also been working on approach to making data tables responsive um, based on a blog post uh, written by Aaron, uh, Aaron Gustafson. If you shrink the, as you shrink the view for it down the table, and the table becomes too wide, um, you can use CSS media queries to shift the table into something more row based. Um, and we've, we've built that, uh, that into our responsive data table template um, and we can use it or not depending on kind of what the project needs. Um, Um, so like here, we used a sort of heat mappy approach to presenting segments of um, responses to poll questions about uh, how people respond to stress. Um, it's presented as a grid on desktop, and then as we get to smaller grid, uh, smaller screens, it's more row based, um, but we preserve the color shading, so you can still sort of see at a glance the kind of the difference in intensity. Um, for most of our projects, we use Google Spreadsheets as a kind of mini CMS, um, one that can take slightly different shapes with every use. Um, so my, my colleague, Chris Groskopf, created a Python library called CopyText, which takes a Google Spreadsheet um, or any XLSX file um, and makes the data accessible for use on the page. Um, and then we write these values to the page with Jinja tags, which is a, um, Jinja is a Python template language. Um, our most common use case is arbitrary key value pairs. Um, we can specify a key and a value in the sheet, in this case, a headline, and then the headline, the subhead, and the subhead. Refer to those keys on the template page. Um, and here in this case, it's kind of tiny, but um, the all uppercase copy refers to like the copy object, like the universe of stuff that came from the spreadsheet. Labels refers to the individual sheet that the key value pairs live on. Um, and you can have multiple sheets in a single Google spreadsheet, all with like different content, different uses. Um, and here's how it looks on the rendered page. Um, I try to collect all of the text in my project, from the intro blurbs to the footnotes to the tiny labels and error messages um, in the Google spreadsheet. It's good for sanity to have um, these like things together, um, and it's good for copy, able, copy editors to be able to see everything all in one place. Um, because like going through the viz on their own, they're not necessarily gonna catch everything and nobody wants to be responsible for the error message with the really embarrassing typo. Um, you can also use the Google spreadsheet to as a spreadsheet and store structured data in it. Um, and then you can loop through it row by row to make an HTML data table. Like that. Um, or you can even write it to the page as a serialized JSON object um, if you want to manipulate it with D3 and make a graphic out of it. Um, this way you don't even have to load in a separate CSV or JSON file, it's just baked onto the page and you can access it immediately. Um, we've also used spreadsheets to reflect configuration. Um, this is from a longer form story, a standalone project. Um, 
here the, the leftmost column uh, refers to a particular display template, um, a chapter header, a photo with a quote, a block of text. Every sort of like style of rendering like gets its own template. Um, and then it feeds that sort of sub-template the appropriate information. Um, this is the template code that kind of loops through that. Um, and here's how a couple of those sort of like sub-templates, those mini templates appear on the page. Um, you have a, a fragment of a title card up at the top, a couple of graphs of text, um, a photo with a pull quote, um, and each of those were separate rows in the spreadsheet and they're calling separate like sort of template includes. Um, this was from a story about a unit within the military that works to identify the remains of missing um, servicemen and women and the relatives of one such serviceman who were frustrated with that office's sort of speed and methodology. Um, similarly, our friends at the New York Times recently released something called ArchieML that works similarly, except it's based on Google Docs rather than spreadsheets. Um, it's arguably a more natural environment to write and edit like big blocks of text. Um, I haven't used it yet, but I'm pretty intrigued. Um, so we have another reason for wanting to separate out text from code, and that's open sourcing. Um, our team motto is work in public. Uh, I letterpress these cards a while back. Um, and we try to be pretty open about what we do and how we do it. Our lawyers are cool with us open sourcing our code, but understandably, um, there's some sensitivity about open sourcing content. Um, that's text, audio, photos, et cetera. Um, so having all of our text in a spreadsheet rather than in the GitHub repo allows us to separate code and content. And on that note, we do have a separate workflow for larger assets, the images, the audio files, and that kind of thing. Um, we don't want them in the repo because they're content. And we also don't want them in the repo because they're kind of huge. Um, they don't change often, and they slow down syncing with GitHub. So we store them in a separate Git ignored assets folder. Um, and then there's a separate process to uh, publish them out to S3 and sync up assets between users. Um, it's a process we're still sort of iterating on. Um, for example, there's no version control on these files. Um, the original assumption being that they wouldn't change often. Um, but if they are changing, and we experimented, we experimented earlier this year with storing markdown files in the assets folder, it's again easy for people to bigfoot each other. Um, so last week, we had a project involving crime clearance data from the FBI. Um, the crime clearance rate measures the number of crimes a police agency solved in a given year versus the number of new crimes reported. Um, clear crimes are counted against the year they're cleared, not the year they happened. So an agency could have a clearance rate of over 100%. Um, clearance doesn't necessarily mean that someone was arrested, tried, and convicted. It generally means a subset was identified and arrested and then passed on to the courts. Um, so we made a lookup tool to, for people to be able to look up how their local police agencies are doing with caveats. Um, and we were going to display these against sort of medians for their population groups, but the, the data was a little, like there, for some cities, like major cities, we didn't have all the data. Um, so it just seemed weird to calculate medians based on that. So we just kind of left that out and displayed messages where the data was a little questionable. Um, so the way we structured this, we had a CSV with agency names, um, states, and IDs to use as a lookup table. Um, and then we had like 22,000 uh, JSON files, one for each agency. And like the normal way, these JSON files took forever to upload, like set it to run and like go to lunch. Um, so my colleague David Eads wrote a script to upload many files all at once, parallelized, and brought the upload time to just like a couple minutes. Um, and this is something I imagine we'll reuse again sometime. Um, so, uh, finally, we published the project out to S3. Um, it's just one command typed into the terminal, um, and it runs a script that pulls down the latest Google Spreadsheets content, bakes out a flattened page, um, syncs the larger assets, and deploys all the files out to Amazon S3. Um, here's a snippet of the Python code that's deploying everything. Um, so once I have my finished product, um, I need to get it on the story page in the CMS. Um, now our CMS at NPR, it's a homegrown system called Seamus. 
um, it's remarkably flexible. We can drop in chunks of HTML and JavaScript, um, even add custom CSS to a page. But there's a trade-off. Any inline code is subject to potential JavaScript or CSX conflicts later on as the site evolves. And we ran into this in a big way when the site went responsive um, a couple years ago. So we've gone all in on iframes to sort of like encapsulate our work. Um, so you can set an iframe to 100% width, but that doesn't make it responsive. The height is still hard-coded. Um, and as the frame like widens and narrows, the content inside it shifts. Um, the text may wrap in such a way that the overall content is actually taller. Um, or the chart shrinks, so the overall content is shorter. Um, but the, the iframe's height remains the same, so the result is that either the content gets cut off or you have this like really ugly white space at the bottom. Um, so based on some earlier work from the NPR tech team and others, uh, we made a library for responsive iframes called pim.js. Um, in its simplest form, um, this is what you do. You add one bit of code to the CMS or parent page. Or if your CMS likes to strip out inline JavaScript, you can embed it this way. Um, and then you add a bit of code to your project or child page. Um, you can specify a callback function to run on load and then every time the page resizes, um, it calls that function. Um, and so this is what I use to draw the charts and um, redraw them as needed. It's just the same function that's being called over and over again. Um, so what all this does, this parent and child thing, um, this sets up a connection between the parent page and the child iframe, and they can pass messages back and forth. Um, messages like the width of the parent or the height of the child. And you can also, within your code, trigger the iframe to um, resize at any time. Say, um, a user clicks a button that opens a drawer of text, um, which increases the height of the content inside the frame. And with that, um, we've served up our project and we're ready to face the next challenge um, in solving so many of the other problems that we have to deal with when creating a project. Our development environment, template code, responsive strategy, putting it on a page. Um, we've prepared our kitchen and then when the next meal is ordered, we can dive right in. So, thank you. Thank you.